I'm sitting here listening to Nebraska, and it's breaking my heart, not because it's plaintive and brilliant, but because it's taking me back to 1982 and our baby. Not even two pounds in intensive care in New York Hospital, far away, we live in Queens. It's what we can afford, but we see her every day, well, one of us does, via the subway, where I sit listening to Nebraska, and Springsteen is singing about a paying a debt no honest man can pay. And I'm thinking, what is that debt? It's marriage, right? It's love, right? It's the privilege of having a kid, right? Not in the song, but in life, in someone's life, in my life. It's a debt. A brutally honest debt, but you never pay it back. No one can. Not with money, not with time, not with compassion, not with care, not with what I make, not even with what you make. I'm not talking hospital bills. I'm talking what forever can never be repaid. So listen, you listen to a song whose line hits you in your kidney and you double over as if you're pregnant, a pregnant woman. Not close enough, not close enough to term, but you birth something anyway and one day it becomes your heart and then your heart gets pregnant and it gives birth to your future, which you learn is made entirely of your past, a past where you're listening to a song, a concept, a whole album, again and again, over and over. The album, Nebraska, which never gets dull, never gets tired, never gets old. <laughs> this po this uh, poem is called Babel. We had a family copy of Isaac Babel's stories, out of which my dad would read aloud when he was home which owing to his employment issues was very often. <laughs> I had no idea what I was listening to, but that's just another way to fail to define childhood, I guess. <laughs> anyway, the stories were short, some just a page, and I let my imagination sail away on some word that jumped out at me. One always did. And then, for those two few minutes, I was outside the battered gates of self, alone in a city, empty of rockets and God, where I saw tower after tower of arrested escape. Um, and this one is called The Secret of Belief. I don't believe in symbols, but there's a hole in my living room window in the shape of a bird. A hailstone punched out the profile outline of a nightingale or bluebird or blackbird or thrush. Well, I have no idea, really. I can't tell a robin from a vulture or a seagull from an eagle. A bird of some kind, though, head, beak, torso, tail, with spindly bird feet clearly in the broken pane. Were I a believing man, I'd almost accept that there was meaning in the shape of broken glass. But nature has no purpose. Accidents are impervious to intelligence. The random is no icon, unless there really is a God, unless unbelief is a bagatelle, unless this is a true calling card of the paraclete. Listen up, archaic torsos. Here's the secret of belief. But shh, it's not for publication. <laughs> you must revise your mind. Ah, way to go. <laughs> um, and this one is called uh, Libby, Lottie, and Carlotta. Libby tried divination, no answer. Lottie turned to numerology, a big zero. Carlotta was interested in philately, but she found that sticky. <laughs> Stay away from miracles, Libby. Do not tattoo the future, Lottie. What doesn't kill you will make you cocky, Carlotta. Biology is destiny to this extent. Our bodies lead us places we otherwise wouldn't go. Darkness is a long arc, my darlings. No one escapes the entry into dirty sex, but you control the ugliness of the encounter. Pain is never love. I don't care what others say. It hurts my heart to read your poems. You deserve a knight, a Christ, commensurate with your beauty, someone halfway decent. Listen, there is a place where parents don't drink, where uncles don't rape, where brothers don't die. Where is it? All I know is it's not on the floodplain. <laughs> And this one's called the Ogon's Branch. I'm from uh, Philadelphia. 
There are stories I will not tell, stories I shudder to remember. You'll forgive me for withholding them from you. You may, of course, not tell me everything about yourself either. A violation of intimacy, to me it seems it's guaranteed. What I mean is, we can tell each other anything, but we don't have to. A string is stronger for its knots. It's not that I prefer living in a house with a locked door. That's not what I mean. What I mean is, did I ever tell you about the Ogons branch? I mean the Ogons branch of the Philadelphia Library. It was on Ogons Avenue between Old York Road and Lime Kiln Pike. 30 years ago, it was old and run down. It wasn't close to where I lived, but I used to love to go the afternoons after school. I'd drive over, hang out, read the paperbacks. No one there knew me. I made friends with a librarian, a young woman from Conshohocken, <laughs> with an odd, cocky smile. Part of her job was shooing out the boozy bums. It was in the Ogons branch where I discovered Intimacy by Jean-Paul Sartre, a book of five longish tales, the only story Sartre ever wrote. With eyes blazing, I devoured them. I ate without tasting, speeding through them like a starving man before a meat buffet. <laughs> but back then, I read many books I said I loved but didn't understand. Back then, that was perhaps the point, to race through the pages, to engulf, to possess the book. That, I felt, was the true thing. It would be decades before I understood what I had missed. If I am a book, I am intimacy. Read me. Wrinkle my pages. I'm not asking for understanding. If you want to check me out, ask the head librarian at the Ogons branch. Yes. Thank you very much.